Hello everyone, and welcome to Medlink Kids, a groovy review of Scooby-Doo. I'm Chris. And I'm Kaylee. And yes, we know that neither one of us is Julie. But we'll be okay. She's put the show in good hands. Mostly Kaylee's. Well, one of us has to be responsible. I know, that's why I let you do it, because it's not very much fun. <laughs> so today, we're here to look at Sandy Duncan's Jekyll and Hyde. One of the new Scooby-Doo movies. Kaylee, how does this one start off? So the gang is heading toward Mammoth Studios, and they notice that it has a sign on it saying that it's about to be torn down for a super-duper market, and they don't seem very thrilled about that. And they talk about how sad it is that such a great studio is being torn down just to make way for a super duper market and then they're for some reason confused when the guard at the gate gives them directions to where they're going and mentions a bunch of world landmarks wait wait can we go back to that super duper market because i've never heard of one of those i'm guessing walmart okay anyway apparently they're supposed to see sandy duncan in a remake of dr jekyll and mr hyde Except Shaggy, for some reason, pronounces it Dr. Jenkel. I don't know what's going on there. I don't think Shaggy does either. Yeah. Scooby, though, decides that he is just madly in love with Sandy, further proving that he is just a human in a dog's body. That's true. See, what I want to know is, who's this Sandy Duncan person? Because I've got no idea. In 1971, she played Sandy Stockton in Funny Face. And after that, she played Sandy Stockton in The Sandy Duncan Show. Yeah, that's not helping very much. 80s and 90s kids might recognize her voice. She played Vixie in The Fox and the Hound and Queen Uberta in The Swan Princess. Ooh, there's some things that are relevant. I'm assuming here that everybody knew who these people were more so back in the 70s when these movies came out. Well, considering this came out the year after Funny Face, I'm pretty sure she would have been recognizable at that point. So the other thing I'm wondering is, how is Scooby supposed to handle this version of Jekyll and Hyde? Because he, Shaggy says right there in the van that Scooby hasn't been able to see any of the other versions because they're too scary. But what does he think this one's going to be? Maybe he thinks it's different since they'll see it from behind the scenes and Scooby will actually know that it's just people in costumes ahead of time this time? Maybe. I don't know. Anyway, as they get closer to the set, they decide to turn down a road because of the location and somehow that has to do with it being a night scene, even though these are all outdoor sets, so it's going to be night on all of them. And... A ghost randomly jumps out in the road, and Fred almost drives the mystery machine off of a bridge. Probably did it on purpose. Probably. But more on that later. They hear Sandy yelling for help and see her running away from we never see what, but she says it was maybe the ghost. But she's not sure if it's really a ghost because she's never seen one outside of amusement parks and haunted, like, how in the house attractions which is weird to me because they're on a movie set presumably there's going to be yelling and screaming for things like maybe a ghost i don't know well at first the gang did think she was acting and at first she was she admits that a little bit later that the scene was supposed to be her yelling help and running away from something and then there was a ghost and she actually started yelling for help and running away and after she after Sandy introduces everybody to her stunt girl, Shirley, who looks suspiciously like Daphne, the manager of the studio, Mr. Thayer, the director who loves to yell at everybody all the time, Mr. Van Henstone. In a vaguely Eastern European accent, too. Yeah, except sometimes it sounds Italian or French or... At one point, he sounds a little bit like Scrooge McDuck. And finally, she introduces them to Daphne's favorite actor, Duke Jason, and his stuntman, Slats. As far as we can tell, Duke is not a real person. So Sandy tells them that strange things have been going on on set. There's been fires, power's gone out, all kinds of strange things have happened. 
and they wonder who would ruin such a wonderful movie. And the stunt girl Shirley explains that they are once publicity, Van Henstone wants to save money, Slats hates Duke. So all three of those people are prime suspects. And then she just goes on to include everybody except for Sandy Duncan by saying that they're all just not very nice people. Let's be fair here, too. The Scooby gang really has no reason to be wandering around a movie set screwing up the production of a movie. Yeah. So the gang decides to stick around and watch them shoot the movie. And for some reason, Shaggy seems surprised and says, Groovy, we get to watch them make a movie. Which was kind of the point of them being there anyway. This is the sound of me face palming many times. <laughs> so they start shooting again. And Sandy is running away from the fake Mr. Hyde. And we see the the faceless ghost hiding behind a bush with a rope very obviously tied to a light pole across the street from him. And he pulls the rope to make the light fall on Sandy. And somehow Scooby is the only one who sees it. And he jumps in and saves the day like the heroic puppy dog he is. Because Scooby is just an all around good boy. Yes, he is. He's a very good boy. How does nobody else see the ghost? I don't know. Or the rope, for that matter. Shaggy goes over and points at the bush he was hiding behind and says, Look, you can tell somebody was over here. And everybody else is like, But how did he make the light fall? You know how else you can tell somebody was over there? (laughs) How? Using your eyeballs. Yeah. After that happens, Shirley gets scared and she quits the movie. Completely. And everybody realizes that Daphne looks the part, so she's kind of forced into being the new stunt girl. Yep, that seems perfectly safe. Yeah, she looked the part, and that's all they care about. Silly 70s safety considerations. So as soon as Daphne gets put into her costume and starts looking the part, they decide they're done shooting for the night. And everybody decides they need to go home and get some rest until they remember that the mystery machine was stuck hanging halfway off a bridge. Because Fred is a wonderful driver and a wonderful parker and just drives off bridges. But something happens when they get to the mystery machine. Bum, bum, bum. It's somehow not only back on the bridge, but pointed in the direction it needs to go to leave the studio. And the gang finds that very strange, and they think somebody's trying to tell them something. Yeah, leave us alone so we can finish our movie. We never do find out how exactly it got unstuck. We're just left to assume that it's the the ghost. Fred, of course, decides that they need to stick around and look for clues. Because Fred has a problem and has to always go looking for clues in places where they're not exactly welcome. Yeah, and after Scooby gushes over how much he loves Sandy again, Shaggy calls him a dumb dog, which is not very nice. No. And Scooby tries to show them what he saw happen, and he says, I'm dumb, and tries to show them the the rope and where the ghost was hiding, and they're like, where did the ghost go? And the bush lifts up, and Scooby falls under, and underneath it into a tunnel along with Shaggy, and the others who were looking right at them somehow didn't see the bush move, and they're like, where did they go? Where did they go? And eventually they figure out by yelling through the ground at each other that the tunnel must go somewhere, and they'll try and find another exit because the suddenly the bush is stuck. They cannot get it to open again. If only they had somebody smart enough to know how to move a bush. Yep. Besides Scooby. Unfortunately, he didn't do it on purpose, and there doesn't seem to be a trigger or anything on the inside. So Shaggy and Scooby follow the tunnel and end up in a desert set where a freaky sheik chases them to a cute little red dune buggy that they decide to run away in because it's faster and they decide it's fun. And to be fair, it does look fun. 
But their fun ends when they decide they want to get a snack or a drink or something, and they drive by a pyramid set and think that it's a refreshment stand. So they can't figure out how to get in this so-called refreshment stand until Scooby realizes that one of the blocks he walked by has moved out of the way and created a little entrance that they have to crawl through to get through, get in. In there, there are some blocks that are conveniently set up to look kind of like a picnic table. And on the side, it's showing uh, Egyptian pictures that look like somebody holding grapes over a cup. And Shaggy decides that means there's grape juice. Shaggy and Scooby are being awfully brave for people who are always scared. Just yeah. going into this random building, yelling for a waiter to come out and see them. Like, of course, you're going to have a ghost or a monster come out and see you because this is Scooby-Doo. How does Shaggy and Scooby not realize that they're just cursed to always have ghosts and monsters come after them? After a while, Shaggy realizes there are no waiters, so it must be a self-serve restaurant. And he notices that the wall is lined with sarcophagi. Except he seems to think they're vending machines, and for some reason, even though this is a movie set, one of them is coin-operated. When he puts a coin in, it opens to reveal... We'll check that after this commercial break. Experience Dungeons & Dragons like you've never experienced before. So girls, tell us about Dave. So, tell me Dave's how great I am. a little drunk and all. Feel the tension. You like some chips. They don't have any chips. Feel the excitement. 29 more javelins. You gonna throw another javelin? Well, 29 more. Epic storytelling. This island, as all the locals know, is the island of Atlantis. And you are not welcome here. And with no swearing or profanity of any kind. Ah, (laughs) jeez. This is... Dungeons and Dragons and Daughters. Find out more at DungeonsDragonsDaughters.Podbean.com, your favorite podcast service or preferred social site. We're also on YouTube. It opens up to reveal a mummy. Which, of course, immediately starts to chase them. Oh, of course. What else do mummies do? Mm, Pretty much chase Shaggy and Scooby. Yeah, that's pretty much it. It chases them right into a lion pit. It turns out that the lion is a robot, but the mummy's controlling it, so it tries to eat Shaggy and Scooby. They probably wouldn't have tasted very good. Especially if you're a robot and don't have taste buds. After that, it cuts to Fred and Daphne, mysteriously without Velma. And they have ended up in Shanghai, near some docks, where there is a pirate that they seem to think is a prop person, even though he's in costume. And the pirate decides to chase them until Fred throws a cannonball at the pirate. Which is also not very nice. No. And it makes him start sinking into the water because he was standing on a little boat. And they run off. And inside the city, they see what Fred calls a real life imitation movie dragon. This is me face palming again. <laughs> And as they're running from the dragon and getting fire breathed at them, they decide to hide behind some potted trees, which, of course, get burned to a crisp. Because what else happens when there's dragons? And then they find some firecrackers, which turn out to be real. And they throw them at the dragon, making a very nice fireworks show in its face. And the dragon ends up backpedaling and falling into the water. And we find out that the pirate has been driving it all along except this pirate looks different until he falls out of the dragon and then it's the same pirate again i think at some point there were going to be two maybe he's a shape-shifting pirate Who maybe knows? he is a shape-shifting pirate fred says we need to go find shaggy and scooby and daphne says and velma i wonder where she went oh now they notice yeah and then it cuts to Velma, who is apparently in Philadelphia and not surprised by that. How is she not surprised by that? I don't know, but she says, figures I'd end up in Phil- Philadelphia. How are all these movie sets still set up in a place that's about to shut down? I don't know. You'd think they would want to save them and bring them to a different place. 
Or at least sell them off to pay off their debt. I know, right? Maybe the super duper market paid them really, really well. And they can afford new sets. Maybe the super duper market is setting up the freezer section in Alaska. Could be. Velma ends up getting chased by the pirate also. And crashes into Fred and Daphne. They all end up in a boat, which the pirate pushes away. So now they're riding in a boat and pushing it along with sticks. This is actually a scene from the opening credits. Except they changed the animation a little for the credits, where Daphne's dress is purple instead of green and her hair is up instead of down but i was always excited about that part when i was little whenever i could catch the credit scenes in there after they get off of the boat it turns out that they are in alaska also known as the freezer section yes and they see something that they call a wolf man it's really a wendigo probably and shaggy and scooby are Also in Alaska, but running the opposite direction. Shaggy has Scooby covering his eyes and flying behind him kind of like a cape, which is really cute. But totally impractical. Yeah. And Scooby tells Shaggy to turn left. Shaggy turns right and crashes right into the backdrop. And right through it, where they end up crashing into Fred, Daphne, and Velma. And comparing what all they were attacked by and shaggy keeps bringing up king kong but we never saw king kong but apparently shaggy and scooby were also chased by king kong at some point and then a bear comes up and attacks them there are a lot of attacks in this episode so the whole gang jumps on a sled and has scooby pull it like a sled dog and they somehow think this is faster than running away from the bear And I feel really bad for poor Scooby. He just collapses when they get to a ghost town instead of the snow. And he just looks so exhausted. They're just not very nice to their little doggy friend. Poor Scooby. Making him do all the work. Maybe that's why he's not scared. He's just too tired. Maybe. And once they get over realizing that they are in a western ghost town, an Indian chief chases him. Chief blood in the eye. Totally not cool. Yeah. So he chases them. He's got a tomahawk in one hand and a bow in the other. And he starts shooting arrows at them. Fred, Daphne, and Velma get locked inside of a bank set. And Scooby and Shaggy end up in jail. They didn't even do anything. I know. And they accidentally managed to lock themselves in the cell of the jail. That's even worse. So while everybody is sitting down against a wall that is conveniently the same wall, Fred is talking and and Shaggy answers thinking that Scooby said it. And after a whole long conversation, they realize that they're talking to each other through the wall. When Shaggy finds out that the others are in the bank, he's like, great, you can bail us out because we're in jail. Or they can do what they actually did and just break everybody out. Yeah, but they waited until the next morning. So by the time they get out, Sandy is thrilled to see them. And she says that she insisted that that everybody search for them after they realized that they weren't there. She's sounding awfully suspicious right now, if you ask me. Yeah, well, I'm still kind of suspicious of Fred with the whole mystery machine moving around and stuff. So at this point, Sandy and everybody decide, okay, the movie's kind of got to go on. They're going to go finish it, and they get Daphne ready for her scenes, which I still think is totally irresponsible because she is not a trained stunt person, and they want to throw her off a balcony. (laughs) It's totally safe. What's the worst that could happen? She could fall and break something. Are you sure that's the worst? That's the worst that I'm going to say here on a family-friendly show. But what really happens is she gets kidnapped by a Mr. Hyde who is not actually one of the ones from the movie. 
The rest of the gang, in the meantime, has been staking out everybody, trying to figure out which person is causing the problems. But none of them saw Mr. Hyde number three, who apparently doesn't understand what a stunt person is for and thinks that Daphne is Sandy. Or whoever did Daphne's costuming and makeup did a really good job because she looks exactly like Sandy. That's true. And it is a really pretty dress, so they must have a good costume designer. Anyway, everybody else has no idea where they went because, once again, there's a trap door. Big surprise on a movie set. And they find a ransom note that helps them realize that this guy thinks he's kidnapping Sandy Duncan. No, I mean, let's be real here, though. The detectives that go around solving mysteries don't find anything. Because Sandy finds the clues for the ransom note. True. She is a much better detective than anybody in the Scooby gang, except for maybe Scooby. Especially since Scooby finds the next clue. He follows the scent to a trap door. So that's like trap door number 12 now, right? Something like that? Yeah, something like that. And so everybody goes through the trap door, and somehow Sandy and Scooby get separated from everyone. Scooby does not seem to mind this very much. Yeah, he's a little bit in love. Um, Sandy and Scooby end up in a prop room where they find some signs and stuff that the letters for the ransom note were cut out of. So they find a really important clue. They know at least where the ghost has been. Mr. Hyde takes Daphne to a medieval castle and keeps calling her Miss Duncan and he's actually being pretty polite until he sees everybody coming after her. And in the meantime, the gang sees her. They see some ski lifts that'll take them up to the castle. And for some reason, Fred looks happy that they won't be able to get to the castle before the bad guy can escape with Daphne. And that's very suspicious. Does Fred secretly want Daphne gone? Possibly. Has he secretly been in love with Velma the whole time? <laughs> Who knows? So as everybody takes the super slow ski lift up to the castle... Which the villain totally can't see them coming on at all. Yeah. Spoiler alert, he really can. The villain once again disappears with Daphne, and everybody else decides to, instead of running down the hill, jump onto a sled that Scooby found. But they could run fast enough to catch up to the sled that was already moving, so I think they slid themselves down even more. Maybe they were just tired, and they knew they were going to slow down, and the sled let them keep a constant speed. Could be. That makes sense. And when they get to the bottom of the hill, they end up right where Sandy thought they would. A graveyard. Why? <laughs> because it's scary. And the villain tells Daphne that he should have taken her here all along. And they're inside of a mausoleum. And he's got her gagged with a handkerchief, which should not be as effective as it is. He didn't tie it like a gag. He tied it like you were tying a bandana over your face to keep dust from getting in your mouth. Or because you're playing cowboys. So the Scooby gang comes up with a brilliant plan. They finally figured out that this bad guy thinks he has the real Sandy. But they have the real Sandy. So one of them must be wrong. And it must be fake Mr. Hyde because they have the real Sandy. Yeah, they start talking right outside the door of the mausoleum and Sandy pretends that they just rescued her. She's like, yay, thank you for saving me. That gag was driving me crazy. What? What? But who do I have gagged up? So he finally realizes he doesn't have the real Sandy and he opens the door and everybody rushes in and catches him. 
And it turns out that he is a famous silent movie actor named Xavier B. Fairchild. Or, oh, sorry, I got that wrong. Zalia Z. Fairchild. Who we haven't heard from this whole episode. Uh, get it? Because he's a silent movie star. Yeah. And he's apparently been missing for years, during which he has secretly lived in the studio. Nobody Not noticed. at all. How does nobody notice this? I don't know. Probably because Mammoth Studio is Mammoth. It is big enough for a super duper market to take its spot. Presumably with a parking lot. And for Taj Mahal and several famous cities and the Eiffel Tower. And and I don't even remember what all. But like half the world is in there. So it's time to bring down the hammer of justice. Since they find out that all he was trying to do was keep the studio from being torn down. Maximum punishment time. The police decide to let him go because Mr. Thayer thought the publicity would be good and it'll help keep the studio open. So is the Super Duper Market just not going to exist anymore? I guess not. I'd assume that they signed a contract. You know, there's probably something bad going to happen for breaking the contract. Not as far as they care in this show. Okay, then. So they rewrite the end of the movie to let the whole Scooby gang be in it, along with Fairchild. And it ends showing a scene where... Sandy is walking Scooby on a leash to a nice little horse and carriage thing. And everybody thanks Sandy for letting them be in the movie because the actress totally has all the power here. Sometimes they do. And the since the movie is finally finished and they solved the mystery, it's the end. And that is Sandy Duncan's Jekyll and Hyde. Oh, I forgot the um, rhinoceroses. Sandy offers to let them be in another movie. And Scooby's all excited until he finds out they're shooting in the jungle. And they keep saying, well, there might be lions and tigers and rhinoceroses. And Scooby's like, rhinoceroses. And it's adorable. Some of those animals actually live in the jungle. And every time Scooby tries to say rhinoceroses, he adds some extra S's, and it is the cutest thing ever. And so he decides not to be in another movie with Sandy after all. And presumably, he goes home and cries because he lost his one true love. I don't know. He still seemed pretty happy that he at least got to meet her. Yeah. But that's Sandy Duncan's Jekyll and Hyde. You have Fred being weird. You do not have Velma losing her glasses somehow. At least not to the point of yelling about it. I don't think she lost them at all. Like, they fell off, but they went to her feet and she found them, so I don't know. I don't really count that. Overall, you just, you have a nice little episode. The plot actually carried it throughout the whole thing. It didn't seem like they were stretching things out too much. You know, besides running between 12 different cities in 30 seconds. Well, that's to be expected on movie sets that are close to each other because you've got to fit a bunch of things in a small-ish space, even though it's a huge studio. Yeah, I guess. If you like hearing about us, though, you can get in touch with Bedling Kids on Twitter and Facebook at Bedling Kids Pod. And if you like talking back with us, you can join the discussion group, the Bedling Kids Podcast and Scooby-Doo Discussion Group. That is also on Facebook. And thank you to Tiff, because she is really cool, and she helps us take care of the Facebook end of things. Without her, I have no idea what we'd do. Probably cry. Besides not have the best moderator on any of the Facebook groups. Also, thanks to Dave Sustain for the music, Night Surfing, and to Julie's family for letting her pass the show along so that everybody can continue to enjoy Scooby-Doo. And just remember, the next time you dress like a pirate and chase people through places where you have no business being, you probably would have gotten away with it if it weren't for us meddling kids.